Hi, my name is Joseph Stiebrick. I'm a principal with Building Science Corporation out of Somerville, Massachusetts. I'm an engineer and I deal with heat and mass transfer, um, building science, building physics, and I'm here to do a presentation on to vent or not to vent. That is the question. Well, hello everybody. Um, let's, uh, let's start. To vent or, or not to vent. Uh, I don't actually look like that anymore. <laughs> Photoshop. Um, this is perhaps the most underappreciated assembly we have in the building industry. It's a vented attic. It's absolutely magnificent. There is no better way to build a roof assembly than to have a vented attic. There are only a few things that you have to do correctly to make this work in every climate zone in the world. You want your ceiling plane to be absolutely airtight. We don't care about vapor tight, we just want that ceiling plane to be absolutely airtight. And then what do we want to do? We want to have lots of holes down low and a few holes up top. You don't want to have lots of holes up top and a few holes down below because you don't want your attic to suck. <laughs> right? right? Because if your attic sucks and your ceiling isn't airtight, you're sucking air out of what? Out of your house and, and that would suck. <laughs> right? Because the air that you pull out of here is going to be replaced from the outside. So the worst thing you could ever install would be say something like a power vent, right? Because you're going to increase your air conditioning bill or increase your heating bill. You don't want to do that. You want this to be absolutely airtight and you want to wash the entire underside of your roof deck with air. So you want continuous soffit vents. Now you don't care about whether you have a ridge vent or mushroom vents or guide. The holes at the top are not as important at the, as the holes in the bottom. And you want a lot of holes at the bottom and not so many holes at the top. And then what do you want to do? You want to like put a little wall in here and fill this with fluffy stuff. Pink's a pretty good color. But I got news for you, the color doesn't matter. It could be other colors. But why, so you basically you're building a bathtub, right? Bathtub with walls on the side that you fill with stuff. The reason you want the walls on the side is you don't want air to blow through the side of the bathtub, right? So you put a bathtub on the top of your house and fill it with fluffy stuff, lots of holes. And you know what? Works everywhere. Works in Tuck to Yuck Tuck and Key West. Unbelievable. The best value proposition of all, right? I mean, you can put R60 insulation in there for almost no extra cost from R30, right? Nodding here, you're in the fluffy business. This would be a good thing, right? So, how can we possibly screw it up? Well, real easy. Let's put the heating system and cooling system up there. What are you guys on, crack? <laughs> What are you thinking? This is unfreaking believably stupid. The hottest place of all is going to be the attic. The coldest place of all is going to be the attic. So let's put stuff up there. What? The only thing up there should be nothing <laughs> besides fluffy stuff and air, right? I mean, what's the big deal? Well, because you can't make the ducts tight. You know, even if they're tight, they're 5% leakage, right? And they're typically 20% leakage. And you get this huge negative pressure, right? Because the air that leaks out of the ducts had to come from the house. If radon was valuable, you would mine it this way. <laughs> if you wanted to collect soil gas, pesticides, herbicides, termiticides, this is the best way to get stuff into your house. You kidding me? This is colossally stupid. And what's the R value on the ducts? Nothing. Right? Nothing. So this is this is madness. This needs to be put inside. 
if all we did was have the ductwork inside with an airtight ceiling vented attic with lots of fluffy stuff, that is probably the most energy efficient thing that you could possibly do in construction in the United States. Unbelievable. Guess what? It's not going to happen, is it? Right? It's, it's unbelievably difficult to take this and put it in here. You know, people don't give space for it. So this is by far the best technology, <coughs> but we have this issue where it's very difficult to convince the industry to do this. To give you an idea of the penalty of just putting this into this, it's about 25%. So 25% loss just to put the stuff up there. It's unbelievably difficult. What's the other thing that happens? Well, we perforate the ceiling, right? Let's put a thousand holes in it. <laughs> then we say, well, that's easy. Make every one of those holes airtight. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, well, you know, write it on the specs. The industry will do it. Just airtight holes. <coughs> airtight holes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I reached for that. I begged for that. <laughs> You know, you're not allowed to ask questions until the end, but laughter is appreciated, okay? <laughs> All right. The other problem, and again, I, I spared no expense at props. When I first started in the business a long time ago, before I went to university, worked with my dad, he was, we were contractors, and we would get roofs like this. You could actually build this roof. Flat ceiling, airtight, and then what happened? I married an architect, and I get roofs that look like this. The more complex the roof, and the more penetrations and trays and coffers and all of that stuff, it becomes unbelievably difficult to provide an air seal at the ceiling plane. So the answer has been to move the insulation to the underside of the roof deck. Not because it's a better solution, but because of all of the other bad decisions that we make to try to compensate for that. Do you understand? So the first best destiny is a vented attic with an airtight ceiling. You go to unvented condition roofs when the roof geometry is so complicated and there's so many penetrations, you don't have a choice. When you cram the mechanical system up there and you have no choice. Those are penalties. Those are penalties. Those are not advantages. Are you with me on that? And, and the problem is, is that we do a lousy job of explaining it. Now, if I've got a leaky ceiling, not even venting will save you from something called ice damming. Because you've got so much heat coming out of the house, if you have snow on the roof deck, you're gonna basically have the roof deck at above freezing temperature. And if the outside temperature is below freezing and you have snow, the snow will melt, it'll run down to the edge, it'll freeze, and you'll get an ice dam. Um, this is uh, heavy. If this falls on you, you will feel it. And if it gets really big, it'll take a deck away. One of the neat things about ice damming is that um, what happens is, is that the water melts, and in the liquid phase, it actually wicks up into the snow field by capillarity. So that the ice actually isn't directly in contact and frozen to the roof membrane or the, or the roof shingles. So you end up with a gap that the water runs down. But it completely freezes here because there's no heat. And so that's why it's called a dam and then it backs up. So the critical area is right here. It's not up here. The other problem with air leakage from the inside is moisture. And it accumulates on the coldest surfaces, basically, the nails first, and then the sheathing. You don't get a lot of damage and accumulation on the top cords of the framing, because they're only they're one or two degrees warmer. And that one or two degree temperature difference has a huge impact on the moisture distribution. So you don't usually have a roof collapse structurally, but if you walk on your sheathing, you'll 
bust through it. And it has the most, Im the most significant impact is on your shingles because the nail holding of the nails is lost. So during wind events, your shingles are lost. So the most common tell is not a rotted roof, but my shingles are blowing off because I've lost the ability for the nails or the fasteners to hold things. OSB doesn't come that color new. <laughs> this is not the answer. <laughs> this is a guy with too much time on his hands warming up every nail. <laughs> smart old guys, you'd basically make that critical area where the dam fold uh, forms slippery so that the snow would slide off or the dam would slide off. Um, this is kind of amusing because this is a, a school and uh, the school board's heads would explode today. You're going to say, well, what we want is to have deliberately let the snow slide off because, you know, if it fell on children, that would be like horrible. But if you're that stupid. <laughs> of course, in, in Aspen, which is the greenest town of all, they melt the snow with electricity. <laughs> but the electricity is produced with PV panels. But they ruin the look, so they don't put the PV panels on the houses. They put them in a field out of town, and they lease them. I don't make this stuff up. This is what, you know, renewable technology does without adult supervision. <laughs> See, the, the right way to do this is to have lots of insulation in your bathtub and then the vent, and then you don't need the snow melt. You don't need the slippery thing. You can do it by not doing stupid things, but apparently stupid things are profitable. for consultants. <laughs> so one of, the all, one of the solutions to all of this is, well, let's, let's just membrane the whole roof. Let's put this fully adhered membrane on this. Well, it doesn't address the real problem. It addresses the water leakage out of the ice dam, but it doesn't stop the ice dam from happening. The way you stop the ice dam is you have an airtight ceiling, lots of insulation, and lots of venting, right? Nodding here would be, Ooh, we're all on board. Okay, this is a very easy to understand graph. Um, that was that's a cynical comment. It's not very easy to understand. This is, you know, what you would get out of a government report. Um, this is the R value of snow based on density. The R value of snow is about R1 to R2 per inch. Um, Canadians know this because we live in igloos and play hockey, but apparently not very well. So this is the R value of snow. Why is that significant? Well, if you have 10 inches of snow on your roof, that would be between R10 and R20. What does that do to the temperature of your roof deck? Okay, this is not complicated. I mean, it, it warms it up, right? And so for years we've been hearing from the greeny weenies that look, if you just have an R60 roof, you can make it unvented in a cold climate because you don't have to vent it to control ice damming. How many people have heard that? Come on, raise your hands. Even if you haven't, just make me look good. <sighs> I'm having to beg for this. This is just not, all right. What will happen is that even with an R60 roof, if you have 10 inches or more of snow on the roof, you're still going to get an ice dam because of the thermal resistance of the snow. In other words, at a high snow load area, when the ground snow load is greater than 50 pounds a square foot, your only option to control ice damming is to vent the roof, even if the ceiling is airtight. You can't put enough insulation in that roof to, not, to compensate for the thermal resistance of the snow. That's just the way it is. So even with an unvented roof, you have to put a vented over roof over it to compensate for the thermal resistance of the snow blanket. It can't be done any other way. This is, a, this is in Vermont, this is an R60 roof, and this is a continuous ice dam. 
why did it happen? Well, because you clearly didn't read my book. <laughs> All right, so what do I got going on here? Well, okay, this is perfect ice dam weather and, and the sun is beating down on the siding here and it's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside and it's sunny. What do you think the temperature of the siding is under those conditions? Okay, you're not supposed to answer. I know this. Thank you for not commenting. You're allowed to laugh. It's about 40 degrees to 50 degrees. The darker the cladding, the hotter the temperature. And what do you think the temperature of the air is that's touching the 40 degree to 50 degree cladding? It's hot. And of course what happens is that that air moves up right into the soffits to cause the ice dam that the vending was supposed to prevent. So there's got to be a catch. Well, of course, the mixing ratio, right? How much air from the wall compared to the free stream, right? All right. This is your problem. Where should the vent be located? Well, right here. And if you're really smart, you insulate the overhang. So in high snow load areas, like in ski areas or on the top of mountains, you always have your vent intake at your fascia, and you have to insulate the overhangs. And you have to have a really high R value. And you have to vent the heck out of the darn roof. All right. This is my favorite place. This is uh, the lodge at the top of Ajax, Aspen Mountain in Colorado. And uh, it's a lead building, which means it doesn't work. <laughs> Dangerous snow slide area keep out. They couldn't get in because all of the snow would slide off the roof. They had their R60, R70 roof, but it wasn't vented. And of course, you got this big overhang and facing, you know, southwest, you get the sun. And so the only solution is uh, hiring basically Australian ski bums to shovel the snow off the roof. And the reason you hire Australians is because they'll do stuff rats won't do. My best friend is Australian, come on. But of course this trashes the, the roof, right? And so what needed to be done is that they needed to vent the heck out of that roof and they needed to insulate the overhang, right? So insulation and air tightness and venting, right? Okay, so what do we got here? I've got a, an unvented roof with a vented over roof with the fascia offset so that the air comes in and goes up here to your ridge. Well, the ridge vent is covered with snow. Well, snow is not an air barrier. It's an air retarder. Slows it down, but I got enough surface area. Yeah. So if you're ever buried in an avalanche and you don't panic, if you breathe slowly, you'll survive. And the problem is not panicking. Good luck with that strategy. And then they, they have to find you before you turn into a popsicle. <laughs> so you got those two things to worry about. But according to a Wolfie simulation, it will probably work. <laughs> All right, so the only reason this works and is a strategy that you would want to employ is if you put the mechanicals up there and there's no practical way of sealing the roof plane. Are you with me? There is, this is not the best destiny. But it's a viable strategy when you have complexity. So for people to say, you can't do this, the answer is, well, no. <laughs> there, there's always gonna be some place where you're gonna have to do this. I mean, this is not where I started with, but there you go. But if you do this in a snow load area, you still have to put a vented over roof. It's not going to work for you. Well, how did the first unvented ruse work? Well, we simply would take successfully performing flat, compact commercial roofs and slope them. And the biggest thing with this compact roof was the air tightness here. You absolutely need to have an airtight ceiling plane. Of course, 
that's the first thing that gets valued engineered out during commercial construction, right? They have the fluted metal deck and they throw a bit of isocyanurate down on the top of that. And the only thing that saved us was a black membrane because the black membrane would get so hot it would bake the moisture back down. And then what happened? Those energy efficient lunatics made us put white membranes down. What were they thinking? Well, you saved a lot of energy, but you didn't get the reverse drive. And what that meant is that you had to have an air barrier. So we basically moved our cold climate problem from Ottawa to Atlanta. Wow. And we still have this argument, wow, we can't have, we can't, we can't afford it. And I said, well, look, you know, just get two layers and install the joints horizontally and vertically offset and you're done. You know, your insulation can be your air tightness layer. Oh, oh, you're a legend. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Who told me that? Old guys. Yeah, they had it figured out. So, well, you know, young Joe, when I was in my 30s, you, you should probably put your insulation in in two layers and stagger the joints and maybe put some tar paper between the two layers. I didn't know until I got older that that was like, wow, you know, these guys know stuff. And, and you know, so I'm, now that I'm old, I'm always bragging about the old guys. So let's slope it. Put down a fully adhered membrane, a couple of layers of insulation with the joints offset horizontally and vertically, another layer of plywood or OSB, screw it down, another membrane shingles. This is a phenomenal, unvented, compact roof. Is it as energy efficient as a vented roof? No! Not even close. All right. Uh, not to scale. <laughs> Okay, this is complicated. Same R value here and here. What's the difference in surface area? About a third, 30% more. So all other things being equal, an unvented roof with the same R value is gonna be 30% more inefficient. Nodding here would, it's, it's not even close, right? The only reason we do this is because leaky ducts have to have more heat loss than 30% to win, right? All right, the other thing is that all, things are not always equal. Where people win is that they do a lousy job of air sealing this and they do a great job of air sealing this. So the only way that you can win this argument thermally is to say that this unvented approach leads for a lower air change in the building because my building construction is tighter. And I am comparing it against ductwork located in an attic that is with the ductwork leaky. It's the only way you can win that. But that happens all the time. So I'm gonna say maybe five, 10% of the time it makes sense because of that. But it's not the best destiny. It's not the preferred. But then we have architects who like the vaulted look. Okay, I get it. And it's beautiful. But don't confuse beauty with efficiency. The best is a beautiful thing that's efficient. But I get a lot of beauty that's not very efficient. But I live with it, why? I'm old, I love poetry, I like beautiful things. I'm gonna give up BTUs for beauty any of the way. And when you get as old as me, you're gonna give up energy for beauty. This beauty thing is a big deal. In a snow load area, you put the vented roof over the top of the unvented roof to make it work. What's snow? Well, people who live in a high snow load area usually know it. They know they get a lot of snow. If you don't know, 50 pounds a square foot, ground snow load. You gotta vent. And it would be nice to have the inlet 
at the fascia and insulate the overhang. This is a, for those of you who are American high school graduates who have not seen this before, this is a map of the United States. <laughs> And it shows the ground snow load. All right, I, I did a lot of these in, uh, back when I was poor and had to work for a living. Um, these are post and beam structures. And the post and beam structures were done with basically compact roofs. But we found that we had ice dams unless we put a vented over roof. And so um, there's our, our assembly, the air barrier, the insulation. Um, learned a lot, but apparently not enough to keep me from embarrassing myself as I got older. Um, did swimming pools, all the structure to the inside, fabulous. This is, uh, was the world headquarters for Building Science Corporation. This is my barn, and uh, I wrapped the whole thing in a perfect air barrier to expose all of the timbers and stuff to the inside. This is in, in Boston. And I put eight inches of foam on the outside. I'm making the world's largest Canadian beer cooler. <laughs> but it's located in Boston. Um, here is my big mistake, 10 inches on the roof. And I should have put it up in two layers or three layers with the joints offset horizontally and vertically. But the most dangerous time of your career is in your late 30s and early 40s. That's when you actually think you know stuff. See, when you're younger, you're convinced you know stuff, but nobody will let you do anything because they know you're an idiot. <laughs> right? Yeah. And when you get into your late 40s and 50s, you're saying, I can't believe I survived the stupidity I did in the late 30s and 40s. Right? So I didn't have any adult supervision, and, and, and oh my god. So the very first winter, And so I'm like, I'm aghast, right? So I'm on the sidewalk and I'm bashing my head against like this and I'm hoping nobody sees this. And one of my neighbors who I haven't met because this is the first winter and haven't, you know, we're kind of, people don't really talk to them, each other in New England. So this old guy, big tall old guy walking his dog, stops and he looks at this and he says, you know, if you'd, put that insulation up in two layers with the, <laughs> with the joints offset horizontally vertically, you wouldn't have this three-dimensional airflow network happening. <laughs> and I looked at him and I, I, I said, who, 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 who are you? And he says, I'm your neighbor. My name is Carl Cash. <laughs> yeah, Carl Cash is probably the foremost roofing expert in the world. He, he passed away recently and, and uh, <clears throat> anyway, so for the next 15 years, Mr. Cash and his mangy dog now would walk by and stop, shake his head, and <laughs> walk away. And my private parts would get sucked up into my body and shrink and shrivel. <laughs> so nothing is more embarrassing than screwing up your own house, right? Um, so why do I talk about it? Well, I finally got around to fixing it. Well, it's an, it's an important lesson. Um, I did have an air barrier, but it did show that we've got network, network flow in the composite. That's a big deal. I mean, I, you, you can, I never will forget this, right? You, you know, it's one of those lessons that, oh man, and, and I only talk about it now because I could afford to fix it, so no, yeah, ha, ha, ha. But so next time I saw it, I knew it instantly, right? And so, well, how come you know these things? Well, I just know these things. I don't tell them that I was like an idiot. <laughs> but usually, if you live long enough and you survive the idiocy, you're you know, kind of smart. It's the time between you get there that is the problem. So this is Juneau, Alaska, and it has probably, we probably had the biggest SIP, structural insulated panel failure, in the industry history. About 400 house, 350 houses um, rotted, the roofs. And I, mean, I, I was in the neighborhood, and I, I knew it right away. The, the tell was mushrooms growing out of the shingles. We call this the Wolfgang Puck effect. <laughs> See, he he's, runs a restaurant and pizza. And I have to explain these jokes. It's not going to go fast. 
So the rot follows the panel joints, ridge and the joints. And uh, amazingly enough, we call it ridge rot because the moisture all ends up at the ridge because of hygric buoyancy and thermal buoyancy. Yes, moisture laden air is less dense than regular air. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so this is not a this is not a vapor barrier problem. This is an air leakage problem at the joints. And you know, because these these panels slide together, you know, just perfectly. You know, they're 30 feet long and you know, they just slide together perfectly. You don't need a <laughs> sledgehammer or a come along in bad language. When we did our first sip roof with my dad, I learned stuff about my mom I had no idea. <laughs> anyway, it's impossible to get your air seal at the bottom. It's easy to get the air seal at the top and you've got this convective looping where you've coupled basically the joint to the interior space. I mean, and the instructions are comical. You know, that panel, you know, lean over and, 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 and put a continuous bead of sealant unbroken. And it's always done on, under warm, dry, dust-free conditions. And Bubba, who's doing this, is always in a good mood. You know, he doesn't listen to country and western music. Well, yeah, if you play a country and western song backwards, you get your dog back, your girl back, your truck back, your job back. <laughs> and you never want to install this on a Monday after a NASCAR race. <laughs> so these two panels are coming together right here. There's your joint. Moisture comes up, hits the roofing felt, changes from a vapor to a liquid, and is wicked away uh, 15 inches by capillarity. Woo! I used a big word there. I, he's, he's the Russian judge, 6.5. <laughs> so here's the splines. There's an air gap here and an air gap here on either side of the upper spline. That's matched by an air gap of paired with another air gap on the lower spline. And you know somewhere between the two, these two, these four micro ducts connect with one another. And you've got this wonderful cycle happening. Yeah, you got these experts there all at $400 an hour saying, yep, you're screwed. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, so I go to Green Bay. This is Molson muscle. This is the inverse Nike sign. Don't do it. And so the, the tell with SIP roofs that were failing is again shingle blow off, right? That's the first thing that you notice. Rarely do you get enough condensation dripping through for stains. In other words, this stuff is happening to you, but you don't know, right? It's, it's one of those, ooh, something bad is happening but I can't tell. So you go up there and it's kind of neat. It's all happening at the ridge. Ah, all happening at the ridge. Ah. Hold that thought. Well, continuous unbroken seal here. Good luck trying to get it here. Try to get a continuous seal here. We call that faith-based air sealing. <laughs> it's part of the new program. It's really easy here, but you know, this needs to be here. So you got to have a continuous tape there. And of course, everywhere the panel is sitting on some side of structural member, how do you get that continuity? Um, it's to the point where I don't think it's possible. And I, I love SIPs. I mean, you know, not like my children. <laughs> and, I, and I like my son better than my daughter. No, I don't. I, I like them both equally. <laughs> The, the point is, is that for SIP roofs, we always want a vented over roof over the SIP because I, have, I don't have the confidence in having the trades to be able to do that fastidious a job for air sealing. And a vented assembly gives you that forgiveness, even with an unvented compact roof. 
I, I just, and you know, what are these put over? They're put over community areas with, you know, exercise things and spas and pools and the bigger and more complicated the assembly, the more likely you're going to get something magical like this and you, 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 you can't, you got to put that safety factor in. Of course, you explain to them, is it, but this, then they put down a fully adhered membrane and say, no, no, it has to be vapor open, right? Not nodding here would, yeah, okay, got it. Well, we fixed a lot of them by overroofing, right? By elevating the temperature of the condensing surface by putting enough rigid insulation on the top, right? Nodding here. But you had only a three to four, three to five year window, right? Before it completely rotted, right? And then what do you do? Then you have to reach down inside and say, how much of this can I keep and how much do I have to rip out? Well, yeah. safety factor, uh, uh, you know, it's, okay, you get the idea. Well, one of the things that we did that worked really well was we said, let's strip away the rotted part. It was usually only a foot to a foot and a half at the ridge. And then cover it with a vapor open membrane and then put a vented ridge cap over it. Works, because where does all the moisture end up? at the ridge. And I'm thinking, oh, I could maybe do something with this sometime. Maybe I should like file that away, huh? Huh? You see some of the possibilities? You guys make pink fluffy stuff. Okay, hold that thought. So what you need is a graduate student that you don't pay. <laughs> you guys use interns. We use graduate students. Uh, this is the smartest graduate student I ever met. Actually, actually, he's an employee. He's now a professor in Texas. Phenomenal guy. And uh, we're doing a roof. And we're creating a, a diffusion vent. And uh, <laughs> I said that it was twice as wide as it needed to be and he did all these calculations and he's smarter than me and he says well uh, how could you possibly just go there and say in two seconds that it's twice as big as it needs to be and, and my answer is well I'm old I know these things how blah, blah, blah. and I says well the roof tells you the rod is only eight inches so I only need an eight inch vent ah. Ah. You need to get out of the lab. <laughs> you don't go to the problem. I don't trust your analysis. You might be the smartest person in the world, but not to me. Now, if you do go to the field, and then you do the analysis, then you crush everybody. There's no defense, except nya, 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 and that doesn't work very well, except in code hearings. <laughs> Anyway, it turned out that this vent was twice as wide as it is needed to be, and it's not a technology that works for hips. But what we did try to do is we filled it with cellulose, and we were trying to get it to be a dehumidifier, a solar dehumidification system, where the idea is we would draw air moisture from the house, it would be absorbed in the cellulose, then with what we call the ping pong effect, it would end up at the ridge and vent, and it works. It just says it doesn't suck out enough moisture to make enough of an impact in the house. In other words, yeah, that's absolutely true, but it doesn't give enough of a dehumidification effect to counteract the moisture load, the air leakage, and everything else. But what it does do is it means that the sheathing is unbelievably freaking dry. And uh, there are palm trees in this picture somewhere. So that gives you a, ooh. Hold that thought. Oh, go to Lexington. Why? Home of bourbon. <laughs> it's like a shrine. These guys are making these panels. They're called nail base. Let's throw them down on the top of the roof. The problem is, is that there's no air tightness at the bottom. And of course, there's never any joints between the, the panels. I'm using a 
biomechanical air sensing device. <laughs> if you lick your hand, it's good to a Pascal. This is not an ASTM test. The ASTM stands for another stupid test method. <laughs> this is very practical. Anyway, so you've got this three-dimensional airflow network because they needed an air barrier where? On the deck. And then, of course, in the auditorium, they want to know, how come there's more of a problem in the auditorium? That's because they perforated the deck for acoustical reasons. Yeah. So, yep, air tightness in Kentucky. So there was the solution, air barrier, two layers of rigid insulation with the joints. You got it. I, I know this, I just can't tell. Oh, I did tell you. Well, all right. So I could put fluffy stuff up here, and I could put rigid insulation on the top of this to warm up the condensing surface. And if you think about it, that makes sense because I'm just taking a wall with insulating sheathing and putting it on the slope, right? And the amount of insulation that I have to put up there is going to depend on the climate location and the interior moisture load. If I have an indoor pool, you don't want any fluffy stuff on the inside. You want everything on the outside, right? But a low moisture load, like, you know, 30, 35% RH for a house, this, this works. Or, you could put the insulation here as your air barrier and have your vented space. This is a phenomenal assembly. And what's neat is that you don't have to be perfect. You need to be good, but you don't have to be perfect. Perfect is hard. Now, we did about 100,000 roofs in Las Vegas with fiberglass bats, netted cellulose, blown fiberglass, with no air space and no air barrier down here. But this was OSB with tar paper. And tar paper is not a vapor barrier. And then we had batten strips with tile. So I've got a ventilated cladding. If you stand that up, it's like a wall that has an air gap behind the cladding. Huh? What do you think? We might be able to work with this. And we did. We got all these, you know. Probably over 100,000 since 1995. This led to the code change. People are asking me, well, how come it only works for tile roofs? Well, not for asphalt shingles, because the asphalt shingles do what? They don't, they don't breathe, because they're, you, got, you with me on this? OK, I, you know, people are like, they're discriminating against asphalt. It must be a fire thing. No, it's not. So. The people that really picked up on it were the cellulose people. I don't know why you guys didn't. Maybe you needed a better management team. <laughs> that was 15 years ago. Come on, relax. Get back in the game. Ah, wrong color, though. I'm sorry. Why did I use this color? Well, they gave it to me. You're stunned. <laughs> but it works. Then we go to Phoenix, and he's got a black membrane, and they just shoved it up in there, and it worked just fine. Why? Because it was a black membrane, remember? And the moment they changed these to white, they got drywall cracking on the interior walls. And I said, I, I got the call, and I says, well, he said, how come the drywall is cracking? Well, you changed the color of the roof membrane. That's when they threw me out. You're a, like a lunatic. How could changing the color of the roof membrane cause drywall to crack? Well, by making the membrane white, the top cords of the trusses got wetter and expanded, and we got truss rise. Huh? Then they opened it up in there, and they saw a little bit of mold. Oh my God, mold, mold, we're all gonna die, die, ah! You know, and it's like, you know, take a Valium, calm down, relax. <sighs> so how to fix this? Well, it was easy. Put rigid insulation on the top, right? With me on that? Well, I, so we just put down that new roof membrane. And that's when folks started spraying foam on the underside. 
because it was cheaper to fix these, which baffled me, was to move people out, take the gypsum board off of the ceiling, spray a couple of inches of foam, and put the, gypsum, the fiberglass back and, and put gypsum board up. I, I mean, to me, I would have like done it from the top, right? That seemed logical, and I said, well, yeah, this will work, but really? And so, you know, that's where it started. Fixing, because they, for whatever reason, they didn't go with this. They went with this. And so then they said, well, you know, what kind of foam can I use? Well, low density or high density? Well, the high density stuff you could use everywhere. But the low density stuff is a sponge, right? Absorbs moisture. And so you need a vapor retarder associated with it, and you need a means of removing the moisture from that attic space. Otherwise, it's going to accumulate over time. Right? So that's where the code provisions came from. So, you know, this low density, half pound density foam is a phenomenal product if you have an air change in the attic that's coupled to air, the house. Now, for most of the buildings, this works just fine because what do we have up in those attics? Well, if you have leaky ducts, the leaky ducts, by virtue of being leaky, and a leaky ceiling means you have what? A, an air change. But if you put in tight ducts and a tight ceiling, you're going to have a problem because the moisture is going to do what? It's going to stay there. So for these unvented attics to work, and by the way, they do work well, is they have to be coupled to the conditioned space or they won't work. Everybody with me on this? You know, so you can't say unvented roofs don't work. In fact, I have a problem with the term. That's why I'm using the term conditioned attic. Now, how many people have heard of unvented crawl spaces? Right, same problem. You can't have an unvented crawl space. You have to have a conditioned crawl space. And, and, and you, know, you, know, you all know that there is a place for conditioned crawl spaces, just like there's a place for conditioned attics. But they're not the most energy efficient option with a clean sheet of paper, but they might be the only strategy that you have on a retrofit situation or in a complex new design, right? So it's a design choice. But if you don't do the coupling, big problem. So, all right, show you all of this stuff. This is an experiment we did 2004, and apparently we didn't publicize it very well. We basically showed there is not reverse drive through the roofing system from the top side. Right? You don't get reverse drive. Well, how do we know? Well, we, we did it the old-fashioned way. Let's build a whole bunch of stuff and see. Now, what this meant was that when we did the first code change language uh, for, for unvented roofs, which should have been called conditioned roofs in Florida, the Florida Building Code in 2001 has a requirement for a vapor barrier membrane, an impermeable roofing membrane. That's because we were suspicious, we were nervous, <coughs> so we put in the safety factor. We then spent four years studying it to say it wasn't a problem, which is why in the IRC language, which I wrote and got passed in 2006, there isn't a requirement for a vapor impermeable membrane. And I thought the matter would be dead, right? I thought, well, you know, okay, we did the work and we got the code change, so, but we didn't publish and didn't say, don't, it's okay, relax, take a Valium, it's not happening. So for the last two years, this is, people are obsessing over this and, well, Steve Rick, you never published a peer reviewed paper. Yeah. We had the an I'm an engineer, we had the answer, we moved on, right? I mean, you know, we, we fixed the code. I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't have a bunch of worthless academics looking over my shoulder saying it was okay. Okay, so this works only if it's coupled and it's vented by diffusion, right? If you want to use spray foam in there, the open cell has to be coupled to the inside space. Has to be. So we started experimenting and we said, well look, why can't I put cedar breather under asphalt shingles? You know what I mean, like, you know, the Brillo pad? 
Or maybe I could convince a shingle manufacturer, you wouldn't happen to know one, would you? To maybe give me a bumpy shingle? So created this experiment in Chicago where we're looking at all these options. Our control is a standard roof and a completely trashed, unvented roof with all kinds of different options. And we're heating and humidifying. And we're figuring out what's going on. So this is our test structure in Chicago. We got away with it because I know the building official there. He said, oh, Joe, if this doesn't work, the ranger's not going to like this. <laughs> I said, well, let's have an opening and invite the mayor. Good idea. See, this is how it works. So we've got a project in Houston and one in Orlando. And the idea is that we're basically leaving a ridge slot because all of the moisture ends up where at the ridge and we're putting a vapor permeable membrane and putting cedar breather in a ridge cap. And we're doing this with cellulose and fiberglass. Because I believe that you can use netted cellulose, netted fiberglass, fiberglass bats, sprayed fiberglass, and then conditioned attic space just like low density foam, except now we're going to use the ping pong effect and move the moisture out through the ridge. And I think that's a huge opportunity because it reduces cost and reduces the risk of the, of the spray foam. And so just so that you appreciate how we got to this, we got to this with failure, not success. I'm convinced after 30 years that failure teaches more than success does. There is an old joke in civil engineering, structural engineering, you should never hire an engineer who hasn't had at least one bridge fall down because they're over designing. But you should never hire one that has two fall down because they haven't learned. <laughs> and so I think there's no substitute for investigating failures in the field and in fact creating controlled failures to see to push the technology to see what it takes to fail and use the real world boundary conditions to tune your models and your experimental work and then you can go places that are magic and with that thank you very much it was a real pleasure uh, doing the presentation if and if you have any questions or comments or, or follow-up, uh, please contact us at buildingscience.com. And there's an information and questions section there, and we'll be happy to get back to you. <laughs>